Thank you to that final panel, panel from the, the Mountain West. Um, home stretch. A couple things. First of all, um, tomorrow morning, legislative breakfast. It is going to be in room 201 of the Capitol Visitor Center. Room 201 of the Capitol Visitor Center. This is going to be a packed event. We're going to start sharp at 9 a.m. We're expecting you know, anywhere between 15 and 20 legislators. We've got a number of speakers. We have a room that fits not enough people. <laughs> there are going to be more of us and there will be space. But it's going to be the kickoff to an important day so that the consensus that we have talked about today, we're bringing to the Hill. And I know that there are people in this room meeting with members, Republicans, Democrats, House members, senators. So tomorrow, you know, think about this from the perspective of a, of a member of Congress. You've opened up your, your newspaper this morning. You've read an article in the Washington Post. Hundreds of conservatives in Washington, D.C., planning out a strategy to move immigration reform. You open up the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the National Journal, and other papers tomorrow morning, and you see, in essence, the same article. That means the meetings that we have on the Hill tomorrow are going to be well uh, paid attention to. Let's put it that way. They're going to be listening to what we're saying. They're going to be wondering what everybody in this room wants to see in 2013, which is leadership from the president and leadership from Congress to pass immigration reform and create a 21st century immigration process in 2013. So tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., the House Visitor Center, room 201. That's number one. Number two, after we're done here, there's a reception at ARIA, which is a, a, a small uh, pizza uh, place just outside the building. Walk out of the doors, hang a left. There's a space there uh, just for light snacks and just to, to continue conversations uh, before everybody heads off to hopefully a good dinner. <clears throat> I'm sorry we can't pay for dinner. Um, that's number two. Well, I think there's no number three other than our closing speaker. Our closing speaker is, um, you know, there are not many people I know, I've come to know in this journey around immigration reform <clears throat> that have done three things. One is beat the bad guys. <clears throat> beat them so that Arizona's SB 1070 didn't come to Utah. That's, no, that's the first thing that he did. And I don't know many people who've been able to do that in the last three years. <clears throat> Second thing that he did was he beat cancer. And the courage that he showed and the fortitude that he showed in that struggle to stay engaged in the immigration debate and make sure that his leadership continued to move the debate forward was an inspiration to me and I know to many, many of his friends and colleagues. And the, th the third thing that he's done that I don't know anybody else, nobody else I know has gotten this. He's been profiled on the Rolling Stone. <laughs> beaten bad guys, beaten cancer, and been in the Rolling Stone magazine. Hey, you know, that's, that, that works for me. So I, I would really ask you to, to put together a, a very warm round of applause for the Utah Attorney General, Mark Sherleff, who is leaving office this year, but thank you, Mark. Thank you, Ali. Uh, yeah, my, my teenagers finally thought I was cool because I was in Rolling Stone. I wasn't on the cover yet. <laughs> but listen, it's a great day today. It's a Kairos kind of day, isn't it, Reverend? Uh, you know, I, uh, I'm no pastor, although I was asked a couple times to preach in our Calvary Baptist Church, and uh, they, they egg you on. So if you don't mind, if it gets a little boring, just say, you tell us, Brother Shirtliff. And it may help me sound a little, little bit like my good friend, but uh, Pastor Stewart, thank you for your leadership of the National Immigration Forum and Ali and, and all your great staff doing amazing things. Give them a big hand if you would. It's an exciting day. It's a, it's a, it's, it's, I tell you, I, I feel it in my heart, and I think you do too. Uh, this is unique. It's a special day. I started off today at uh, the press conference because I looked out and saw the White House, and I thought of my little girl Annie, my 15-year-old, who, and I told you some of this this morning, but some of you didn't hear it, that, uh, you know, you wonder what they, what they learn from their parents. And, and all Annie's been cared about is soccer and, uh, and pop music and rap music and boys. But she, uh, I was out of town, and she, said, she, she texted me and said, Daddy, uh, my friends and I are going to see Lincoln. I'm like, really? You know, that's kind of a, you're 15. <laughs> what do you know about that? Uh, she, uh, as soon as I got home, she had tears in her eyes. I said, Daddy, you have to go with me. She was moved. 
he was deeply touched about this concept of people st taking a, a Kairos moment in history and focusing on people and on the humanity of, of individuals and on who we are as God's children. And uh, we've we haven't had these discussions, but here she is, 15, saying, Daddy, I, she wants to do something about it. And I appreciate you bringing it up. You know, Abraham Lincoln, if you go see that movie, it, it, it was clearly a, a Kairos time. And he was a man fit for his time. You know, it starts out, interestingly enough, at the very beginning, he, Lincoln's there talking to some soldiers, a couple of actually colored troops. Uh, and uh, then a couple other uh, white soldiers come up, and they, they, they start quoting from the Gettysburg Address because they remember it. They, they were younger then, and they saw and heard his speech, and they memorized it, and it inspired them to, to go fight for freedom. And that's kind of special, but then when they leave to go back, the one uh, Corporal Ira Clark, Corporal Ira Clark, who was uh, from 5th, 5th Massachusetts, he's, he's trying to remind Lincoln that we still don't have full pay <laughs> and some of these things. But as Lincoln thanks him, he turns to walk away, and as he does, he turns back and says, and he quotes the president from a couple of years earlier at Gettysburg, it is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us. We here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. Now, I know this isn't slavery. Uh, please don't report that I've compared the modern issue to slavery, and, and nothing can compare to that. But the uh, immigration issue is an issue of freedom, about human dignity, and about a country coming together to do the right thing, despite our differences. So it is that time. And what surprised my Annie, frankly, was, the, was as she watched this movie, and she's like, Daddy, those people who are, who are fighting for freedom and individual dignity and rights are Republicans. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But they were conservative Republicans, and they were radical Republicans, and, and yes, it took Democrats to step up and, and kind of buck the trend of their leadership and do the right thing for the right reason. Now, this, uh, I, I love etymology and concepts and, the, and this, this kairos, I, I, I study the Bible and I know what that means. I love the, the concept of, you know, that, that God-ordained moment. But kairos actually, you know, it's a Greek. It, it, it comes from, kairos was the youngest son of Zeus. He was the god of opportunity, right? And there are other, if you look at the etymology and some of the ways that this, this word comes from, one of them is from archery. Talking about a, a long, narrow passageway that an expert marksman has to shoot his arrow down. And it has to be delivered with such accuracy and such power that it can make it through at that moment. Again, seizing the moment, seizing the day, carpe diem, you know, if you will. And, and, and that's what we had to do in Utah. We knew, we saw this headlong rush to, as, as explained, to punitive enforcement only that only hurts the economy and hurts uh, public safety and devastates families and community and rips apart the fabric of our society. But we had to have something besides just say no. And we, going forward, have to have something just, just say no to, well, we just have to pass, uh, you know, stronger border enforcement. That's the answer. That's what we're going to do. I mean, that's what many Republicans have been talking about and conservatives, uh, that there has to be alternatives, and there are. And in Utah, we, you know, I, I was very pleased we picked up the Utah Compact, 250 words, Natalie, is that what you said? About 50 words less than the Mayflower Compact. Uh, we, uh, we in our family like to do genealogy, and... I was proud one day that when one of my travels to Massachusetts to stand on Pilgrim Hill inside of the, the Mayflower recreation and, and, the, and the rock and sit, sit by my granddaddy's grave, who's buried there, uh, eighth great grandfather, William Shirtliff, Captain William Shirtliff, who, when his father was struck by lightning, my ninth great grandfather and killed, uh, my grandmother married uh, the son of a signer of the Mayflower Compact. If you understand, the Mayflower Compact was about, you know, these people had gone off course, they went way up north, and it, they weren't all together, they weren't all pilgrims who were going to form the Plymouth Colony. So there wasn't this uniformity of belief, because there were carpenters, there were secular people on board, there were people who, have, who were not of faith, but they knew that they had to have some principles, very simple principles, that they agreed to before they set foot on this new land. That was the Mayflower Compact. Very simple, 304 words. But principle about cooperating, coming together. You know, that, that is the history 
of this, the concept of politics. Now, Aristotle was the first to use politikos. You know, it was interesting. I spoke to a group of students one day. Um, Got to love these young people. And, and this was a group of really smart kids. Uh, this kid probably going to grow up to be like Steve Case. He, he, and so I said, so what is politics? What is the definition? This kid jumped up. Well, sir, that's easy. I like the etymology of uh, the word politics. It's, um, it comes from the word poly, meaning many, and ticks, meaning blood-sucking parasites. <laughs> I'm like, man, ah. <laughs> but politics is a dirty word these days. I mean, uh, people, you can see it by the favorability ratings in Congress how people feel about the inability to come together. When you had the last four years of everything that was proposed by the Democrats and by the administration, there, you couldn't support it because it was this, we have to one-up you. It was gotcha politics. The inability, to, I mean, just in a matter of a couple of years, the ability to work across party lines just deteriorated, disappeared. People are upset with that. Uh, no, Aristotle, politics meant a community coming together for the good of the community. And America, in particular, was that special God-blessed place where this was to happen from the beginning of the Mayflower Compact all up through our history and what we meant and what we represented. So during this whole debate, when uh, Paul Merrill or, or Chief Burbank and I were on the radio or in panels and, and people were throwing out things like, we, you know, look at Mexico, look at their immigration laws, or France or Russia, they're a lot tougher than we are. I kept saying, why are you comparing us to, the, to other countries? America is special, it's unique, it was based on this concept that no matter who you are or where you come from, you should be able to succeed here. Succeed in this country by just rolling up your sleeves and working hard. Now we have a history, obviously, of, of uh, racism. And, and, and in a time when even though Thomas Jefferson penned those immortal words, all men are created equal, it wasn't true. It was a great concept, but it wasn't true for millions of Americans. And it took people like Abraham Lincoln, and then 100 years of civil rights issues, and people who would stand up and, and fight for that. And, and today, we still face these same issues of divides on socioeconomic lines, on, on sometimes on religious basis, clearly political, and even, yes, in some racist and uh, national origin lines when it comes to this debate. But we've made it through in the past. When the Irish were, you know, the, you read the newspaper articles back in, when the Irish immigration migration was coming here, and people would say, you, you want to stop crime in America, Chief? Sheriff? You throw out every Irishman, send them back to Ireland, it'll end all crime. That was the attitude, how they were treated. And then the Chinese who came over to build the railroad with the Irish, as they, as they came from California, Nebraska, and met in Utah, frankly, having, having many of them died uh, uh, excavating uh, caves and tunnels and, and building bridges, these minority groups here, migrant workers, joining together this great nation in Utah, where they put in a golden spike and they actually let a group of Chinese and a group of Irishmen take a hit on that golden spike, signifying the, the, what they had done in, in, in the unifying this nation. In fact, on the golden spike, it said, may God continue to unite this great nation as these two railroads join the two great seas. And so I thought it was, it was entirely appropriate We've been in Utah to get this going, but this concept in, in America we're talking about here today, this Kairos moment, is... Uh, is one that I think we're up to the task. And people say, really, you know, do you really think this can happen? I believe, and I know everybody in this room believes that this is true, if we can get out there and educate. The biggest, let's say, casualty on this immigration debate over the last many years has been the truth. And the only way that you pass an Arizona-style law is because of misinformation and lies, uh, flat-out lies. And, and, you know, good, good feeling people across this. I, I had senior citizens, women come to me just terrified that we're being invaded by a foreign power, that someone who has brown skin is going to move in next door with weapons and drugs. And, you know, it, that's because they've been frightened by a well-organized campaign of misinformation. And, we're, and, and so what we're here to do is counter that now, beginning with Congress and across this country, is to educate about the truth. And you heard it today. From, from businesses and corporations and from, from that great free market of America that makes us and, and maintains us a free nation, from law enforcement and from, of course, the great faith-based institutions. And these are the people, every, every member of Congress just about, I think every member, they believe in a God. They, they may call them different names. They, they wear pins saying they support law enforcement. Of course, they recognize 
despite they may have different attitudes about the role of government in regulating free market, but they all understand free market and what this country was built on. And they will hear and listen to that if they feel like you, they have your support and you're behind them. You know, if uh, it, going back and concluding with the issue of kairos, one other etymology they say comes from weaving. Kairos is when the loom is moving back and forth. Kairos is that one moment when the threads open up just long enough for the shuttle to pass through and grab it. It goes through and it pulls all the other threads into one beautiful fabric. And that's, that's what we're talking about. That's what we're trying to remind people of, of what America is and why we're unique and special. When I say what we're trying to forge is a, a uniquely American solution to this problem, a special solution filled with compassion and a recognition of the, the dignity of each and every person. They were all sons of a, of a loving God, Father in heaven, Jehovah, Allah, whatever, whoever, whatever name you use. I want to just conclude with this. It's fair, if, if we can just get people to understand who we're talking about, that, that the use of a word uh, anchor baby when talking about a child of God is offensive. You know, that illegal, calling somebody illegal is just wrong. <laughs> to say that we should take away, you know, thank God for the 13th Amendment, thank God for the 14th Amendment. You know, those radical Republicans after Lincoln was assassinated went on to pass the 14th Amendment. They had to overturn the Dred Scott decision. It said, because you're black, you are not a citizen. And the 14th Amendment had to change that, and it was those same people who, who pushed that through. And now we have Republicans saying we ought to repeal that? Are you kidding? To create a second-class group of citizens? No, that is, that is one we have to absolutely stop in its tracks if we haven't already. I, I haven't heard them talking about it lately, and I hope they will continue to, uh, to pursue that. But, but just, you know, if I just, people ask me, well, well they talk about these, these kids, the, the, the anchor babies or the, or the children of, un, of unauthorized aliens. Who, why in Utah are you letting them go pay in-state tuition? Why are you subsidizing their education? And I just simply say, well, these are the kids who attended elementary school with your kids, who played in junior jazz, who danced in the recitals with your children, who were in scouts and, and proudly waved that flag and pledged allegiance to it. These are kids who walked down the graduation aisle with your kids. Why are you treating them differently? And please, if you really want to know about them, come with me to a Latinos in Action class in a local high school. And listen to these, these kids who are Americans. It's the only country they know. When I first went and asked them, what does Latinos in action mean? They said, well, we're Latinos. We, we have two benefits. We are bilingual and bicultural. And we have things we want to offer. And we want to take action to give back to this country we love. If you sit and talk to those kids, and 90% of those classes are undocumented kids. This is, if we can just get the people in America and Congress to realize that's who we're talking about. I think we'll be successful. In, uh, in closing, I, I, Natalie asked me to do this, and I, you can talk, I can talk to you later about our progress, I guess, with the federal government when it comes to our guest worker program. And we're actually making progress because two years ago I started talking to them about all you have to do is look at our guest worker, our temporary worker program, and just say to yourselves two words that we know. That's prosecutorial discretion. You can't possibly arrest every individual in this country who is employing an unauthorized alien. There's some really bad ones. That's who you ought to focus your efforts on. Those who pay under the table and make people work hurt and threaten and don't pay them and threaten to call ICE and all the other things. Those are who you need to focus on. Don't focus on our guys. Uh, and the, the good news is while they haven't yet authorized us uh, and say they're going to exercise prosecutorial discretion or deferred action on our temporary worker program, they've now done it with deportations and most recently with Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, which I applaud. It's the right thing to do. Next step, we hope, is they'll recognize our, our temporary. And if not, the best answer of all is, forget Utah. <laughs> Let's do it nationally, right? Let's have a national temporary worker solution. So in closing, I say that, again, we, we can come uh, together uh, across so many divides. And we, I know we've been mostly conservatives gathered here today, but I reminded people this morning that, that there are great liberal, progressive, immigrant rights groups and individuals who have been dedicated their lives for decades on working towards this. They are our natural partners. And I think a beautiful example of this, and Natalie, did, I wasn't going to share this again, but Natalie suggested I do that, is, is the fact that I've gotten to know uh, Julie Rodriguez Chavez, who's in the White House in, in the Office of Immigration, Immigration and Latin Affairs, 
uh, she, Latino affairs. Uh, and you know, just, just by taking a moment just to express something personal with somebody, these developer relationships you can work well with. I, I was delighted to hear that, that her grandfather is Cesar Chavez. Uh, and uh, recently, the, the White House, I think the president actually went out to California and, and dedicated a, a park or a, for uh, his resting place, Cesar Chavez. And so I just, I just said, I just sent her an email saying, you know, congratulations. You, you probably not do this, but as a Republican conservative, I love your grandfather. I, I quote him every chance I get, even though he's a, you know, considered a progressive uh, farmer's rights worker, uh, advocate in the day. But his words ring true. And, and actually, Pastor, you, you quoted him when you said, si se puede. That's uh, one of my favorite quotes. But it, you know, it really, when he talked about it, he was talking to the farm workers being together as one. But his message is so it resonates, what resonates with us today in what we're here about today. And I know, listen, we all know that not all immigrants are Latino or Hispanic or speak Spanish. We all know that the official language of this country is English and that people get ahead by learning English. But I love the Spanish language. It's so beautiful and so pure. I love to pray in it. I love to, to, to express words of love to my wife in Espanol, right? So let me, just, let me just finish by quoting his words, and I'll translate it for those who don't understand it. But he's, when he's when he leading up to Si Se Puede, he said, you know, siempre te, debemos andar como una sola familia. So we should always walk like one family. Porque estamos en la misma causa, la misma necesidad. Because we're all on the same cause, the same need. Said, porque compartimos, fíjense, compartimos el mismo futuro. Together we make up the same future. Said, uh, solo no valemos nada. Alone, we don't, we're not worth anything. Pero juntos valemos mucho. Together, we, are, we have great value. And they said, la gente tiene que sentir su ser. People have to feel, people have to get the feeling of who they are. In this case, Americans, and those who knew Americans, and those who want to benefit from the great blessings this country has had to offer, and which we benefited from. La gente tiene que sentir su ser, sentir que si se puede. Yes, we can. Si se puede, que se puede hacer. It is true. It was true then. It is true now. And I think together, this is something that will resonate across the heartland of this country, from sea to shining sea, across the fruited plains in the Midwest, and even in the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> And uh, I'm very confident that with this leadership developed here today, this message will go forward in 2013 and will be successful in, in something really historic and significant. Thank you for letting me be a part of it. Later. Thank you, Mark. I, don't, I can't think of a better way to end this important and, and powerful day other than to share a beverage with everybody um, at, at ARIA. So just to repeat, um, it's, about, it's approximately like a three-minute walk out the door, up the stairs to the right, veer left to the Berlin Wall. This is the Reagan Building, after all. And it's outside on the left. There will be signs and some staff pointing in the, right, in the right direction. See everybody at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning at the House Visitors uh, Center. A lot of work to do today. We've done a lot of work today. Or a lot of work to do tomorrow. Thank you for everything. See you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>